Hi and welcome. We are excited to have you all here. My name is Erin Ficker. I am with the Great Lakes PTTC and we are very excited to have everyone here um, joining us today for alcohol policy and how COVID uh, changed our alcohol policy landscape. So we are gonna wait just a minute until we get um, folks into the room and then we will get started. In the meantime, if you would be so gracious as to put into the chat, um, we are looking for um, in the chat your uh, where you're from and maybe what uh, agency you work for. Let me see if I can get that. Your name and your, you don't have to post your name because we'll see it, but your organization and maybe where you're located. So for example, um, I'm gonna add Great Lakes PTTC. And I'm from Chicago. Wonderful. Oh, look. So we Tacoma, Washington. I love you, Tacoma, Washington. Way to be up early this morning. And right on it, I grew up in Puyallup. So no one knows that. Chestnut Hell from Illinois. Oh my gosh. Newport, Washington, Columbia, Columbia, Missouri, Tucson, Arizona. Love me some Wisconsin, Michigan. Oh my gosh, you guys are going so fast. Colorado, New Mexico. Okay, and then you slowed down. Like I was like, wow, Seattle. Um, Michigan, I love, ooh, I love ooh, Michigan. I also love you, Benton Harbor, Michigan. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, let's keep it coming. We have people still coming in the room, but I wanna go ahead and get started because I'm really excited about our topic and I'm really excited about our presenter today. So again, for those of you who are just joining, my name is Erin Ficker. I'm one of two prevention managers at the Great Lakes PTTC. Um, and I'm really happy uh, that you've decided to join us today for this exciting topic. And from Muskegon, where I was last summer, love it. Um, we are so happy. So please continue to kind of put your name in, where you're from uh, or your, uh, and the agency you work for us to kind of get a feel of where people are at and what they're doing. Um, so we're excited to have you guys here. We have folks from all over the country, it looks like. I just saw someone from New York. We have people from Tacoma. We have the whole gamut. So thank you for being here. And um, we are excited to welcome Maureen. Do we have a poll, Maureen? Are we starting with a poll this morning or just entering in the chat? Um, I think she we were, oops. Mm. I, I think we were um, just saying we will have polls. Okay, great. Um, so we will have polls moving forward. Thanks. That's helpful. Um, so we will have polls moving forward. Um, and we ask that you um, share that with us. Um, if we do, why don't we put up one while I do some kind of housekeeping? And that one is um, on your experience with policy work. It'll help us kind of as we move through this conversation, kind of understand what your experience level is. Um, we have a friend from Ohio, welcome. Um, so we just wanted to ask you what your experience was working on policy. So have you worked on policy? Um, do you have no experience working in, in alcohol policy? That you've started doing some of that work after COVID? During COVID, were you doing any of that work? I mean, was any, were any of us like, right? Um, or, and were you doing some of that work before? And this is, uh, you can answer, I think, you can pick as many as you'd like. So um, if you've done work before, during, and after COVID, that's great. If you have uh, no experience and just wanna answer once, that's fine too. So um, as you guys answer that poll, um, great. Yep, it's multiple choice, multiple answer. I don't know how that works. Anyway, um, we're excited to be here. We are from the Great Lakes PTTC. We are funded by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration uh, or SAMHSA. Uh, this presentation is um, part of that SAMHSA contract and the opinions expressed here are the views of our speaker and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. There's no official support or endorsement from DHH, DH, DHHS or SAMHSA and the opinions in the presentation should not uh, infer that. So we'll move on and let you just remember, remind you that as we engage in this very interactive webinar where we are gonna ask you guys to be answering polls, to be writing in the chat, to be really sharing, to make this a dynamic um, event, 
that we use affirming language. We believe that language matters and that words have power. So we use person first language and we ask that you do the same in all of your, um, in the chat and in comments uh, as we move forward. So thank you for, for remembering and keeping that front of mind. Um, we have a couple of housekeeping issues. So Shannon Cassidy is here with us uh, uh, as tech support. Um, and if you have any issues, you can just chat with her um, using your chat feature at the bottom and you can direct chat her. Um, or if you put it in the main chat, she'll get back to you. Um, there are captions or um, live transcripts if you need that. And you can use that on your Zoom toolbar. If you can find that, um, that is there for you. Again, if you have any trouble, you can reach out to Shannon Cassidy. We need to move to the next slide. We also, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we don't have a question and answer section right now, but we do have a chat. So um, Shannon and I will be keeping a close eye on that. So please feel free to throw those in at any time. Um, we, you'll be directed to a short survey at the end and we really super appreciate it if you would take the time to complete that. It takes just a couple minutes and um, it is really important for us as we think about improving and moving our work forward. So we appreciate your feedback. So for certificates of a, oh, certificates Oops, of attendance sorry. will be, that's okay. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attend the full session. I wanna be clear, you need to be here for the entire session, um, we need you to have your correct full name in the uh, in Zoom. So if you happen to have like your agency name or a phone number, please make sure you take a minute to change that name and make sure we can see that you are. Yeah, and it looks like I'm scrolling through the participants. It looks like everyone's got their full name, which makes this much easier on us. So if you have your full name in there, it can take up to two weeks for us to get certificates out. So please be patient with us. If you do not receive a certificate and you did attend the entire session, then um, please reach out if you haven't received that within two weeks. Um, otherwise, uh, you can expect that then. So let's keep going. I wanna get to the meat of this. This is brought to you by the PTTC and SAMHSA. I feel like I've already said a little bit about that. Let's keep going. And I'm excited to, to welcome Maureen. Uh, and I, I love Maureen, she's fantastic. I try not to say her last name because I don't wanna get it wrong. Maureen, you want to give it to me one more time? Because I'm always afraid of messing sure, it up. Sure, and I'll give you how you remember how to say it. Oh. So it's Boozalaki, booze under lock and key. Boozalaki, I love that. Boo yeah, Boozalaki. Um, thank you so much. And Maureen is the director of the Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Project at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, she has so much experience in public health and policy and systems change, which is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So we're really lucky to have such um, an esteemed expert with us today. Um, she is the co-chair of the Wisconsin Public Health Association uh, Public Affairs Committee. So public, uh, public health and policy just right hand in hand in all of the work that she does. So as we move through this, please take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions um, as we have such, uh, such a great expert um, on this topic in the room with us. Um, so I am gonna keep moving us forward, I think. How about we share the poll? Oh yeah, we have another poll here. Well, yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, share the response of the poll. So this is the poll we asked people, thank you, um, what their experience was working in policy. And it looks like we got a pretty solid amount of answers. So thank you for doing that. It looks like about half of us have no experience working in policy. So hopefully this will be helpful for you to think about um, how to do policy work. We did talk about that at a webinar last week. If you were unable to attend that webinar, uh, feel free to listen to the recording once it's posted on uh, the Great Lakes PTTC site. Um, um, and the, um, yeah, so, and then we'll have another one in a week and that will help, that will uh, kind of continue to build on how you do this policy work. So for those of you who don't have experience, please know that we are providing you a full, um, series on 
on alcohol policy. So the others of you, it looks like you have done work both before, during, and after COVID, um, which we all know was a really challenging time for alcohol policy in this country. And uh, Maureen's really gonna dig into that with us today. So thanks for taking the time to do the poll, Maureen. It's really helpful for us now to know who uh, has different levels of experience in this work. So great. Okay. Um, I am going to turn it over to Maureen now to walk us through the objectives for the training and to get us started on the content. I'll be here watching the chat, jumping in uh, as needed to make sure questions are answered. Uh, if you need anything that's not tech related or have questions that you don't want to ask the whole group, feel free to direct chat me. Otherwise, let's get started and I'm going to turn it over to Maureen and I am going to stop talking. Thanks, Erin. Um, so the objectives, we want to look at the alcohol landscape pre-COVID. Um, I think it's important to know sort of what was happening um, before that hit. And then we'll talk about a lot of the rapid policy changes um, during COVID. And I will be interested to hear what happened in your community, in your state. So be ready to share some of that in the chat. I'll also share some data about the impact of COVID on excessive drinking and um, alcohol related mortality. I'm sure many of you have seen at least some of these um, data points. And then we'll talk about the three tier system, which um, was started in the 1930s after prohibition um, and how there are proposals that are breaking that system down and why that might be a concern. So the pre COVID landscape. So I'm already asking um, to throw this in chat. Before March of 2020, did your state have home delivery of alcohol? So I'll give you a quick example. In Wisconsin, the only thing that could be delivered was wine, and there were special permits. And, you know, uh, at least I've heard that they did ask for ID and verify age. Um, I don't, I, I, I can't say that's always happening in other states from what I've heard, but. Um, that's, you know, home delivery of alcohol. Did your state have cocktails to go? Could you just pull up to a bar and grab cocktails to take with you? Um, did your state have curbside pickup or click and collect? Curbside pickup would be, um, you know, ordering from a restaurant that you actually order alcohol beverages and food um, or just alcohol beverages in some cases. And then click and collect would be where basically you're um, putting in a grocery store order and you add a six or 12 pack of beer um, and uh, you'd be able to, you know, just open your trunk and have them put it in. So let's hear from folks in the chat. Did your state have any of these before March of 2020? I was super muted. Um. <laughs> I was like talking away. Uh, so it looks like a lot of people are saying they had none of these. Maybe some people had a little bit. Um, so in like, it looks like Karen, uh, Karen is saying yes, in LA, they had some of these um, already in place. Most people I've seen, no, did not have uh, the cocktails to go, alcohol delivery seems like it was kind of spotty. Some people had a home delivery uh, before COVID Massachusetts, it looks like did. Um, grocery store, you could do that pickup with an ID that kind of click and carry, but an ID was required and hopefully that was actually implemented. Um, Georgia had none um, and then got them all. <laughs> wow, you got, got COVID and all these policies. Um, no curbside pickup. It looks like, yeah, like some people are saying, yes, they had those. Um, I'm curious if you said yes, can you tell us where you were at? Um, Instant cart would deliver alcohol, but you had to scan the ID and no cocktails to go for some of us, but really lots and lots of no's uh, to almost all of these, uh, but some kind of that grocery store delivery. Um, uh, cocktails to go. Uh, in New York state during COVID and wine delivery before no grocery sales for anything except for beer and cider. Um, interesting, in some places in Texas, you can drive through the beverage barn. I've been to the beverage barn in, uh, in Austin, Texas. I have driven through it, I will admit, um, where you could get this, some alcoholic beverages in, in your car. So that was pre COVID. Um, 
uh, a very specific Texas situation. Um, you had wine home delivery with ID in Oregon. Um, so it looks like across the country, there's kind of some diversity of what was available or what people were doing. Um, however, uh, it looks like there was a vast majority of people are saying, no, this is not. Um, yeah, and in Texas, those beverages were sealed and re were required to be sealed. I remember that as well. Um, so Sharon, great, thanks for sharing that, that's helpful. Um, so I think we can move on, Maureen, but um, really, I think largely, these weren't in place for some folks, variations. Right. <clears throat> also just talking about the landscape. Um, so there was a large study done um, on the alcohol policy landscape. And obviously just what we heard, state policy environments vary significantly in this. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on impaired driving laws um, and so there's this focus, and I would say, in my opinion, that a lot of that focus kind of comes from the alcohol industry. It's not the alcohol is not the problem. It's the, this person that is driving that is impaired is the problem. And so we have to fix that, right? And so that's where most policy changes are. So it's not dealing with the excessive consumption of alcohol. Like why is that person impaired getting in their car, right? But it's, you know, and ignoring many of the other alcohol related deaths or most of the other alcohol related deaths. So this study um, <clears throat> is relatively recent. It's in um, your resources, so you can take a look at it. And I would encourage you to do so. It really has some things that I think are still important to know, even though a lot of the landscape has changed since COVID. Um, they also had like a scale that they did. And so like a perfect score would be 100. And there was no state, and I say including Utah, that was above 68% out of the scale of 100 most states were below 50% in terms of having policies that reduce excessive alcohol use. Um, so again, we haven't gotten the message out, I think enough. And I'll say this in general, you know, you maybe have a different situation in your community or your state where we're not tying some of these other problems back to excessive alcohol issues. Falls, for example, are huge. There's a lot of people in our state that die from falls every year in their alcohol, you know, some falls are not alcohol related, obviously, but many are. Suicide, drownings, railroad crossings, I could go on um, in terms of, you know, there's a percentage that are generally alcohol related um, deaths. So we don't really, we need to make sure that people understand that. So they're not just thinking, well, we'll just take those people who are impaired off the road, that's, that's really not enough. So do folks know about the three-tiered system? Thumbs up, thumbs down, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, so it really is the bedrock of the US regulatory policy structure uh, around alcohol. The three-tier system is like an hourglass structure where producers are on the top, funneling down to the wholesaler in the middle where you can make sure you're tracking tainted alcohol products. Um, you get make sure those excise alcohol tax collections are occurring. And then it fans back out to retailers who get the product to consumer. Um, the three tier system operates in the background to ensure that um, there's product safety, there's tax collection, and you prevent market domination by restricting one tier from having a financial interest in another. The reason why this all happened is that was common practice pre-prohibition era because there was aggressive sales taxes and heavy consumption of alcohol. So you can see like the pendulum swinging back and forth, right, um, with this. So the, um, the, the system requires businesses operating in these three tiers to be separately licensed and owned, independent from each other. And it, like I said, prevents that marketplace domination by large companies. Um, and, and that's supposed to be kind of a safety valve for all of us. Um, and then having not wholesalers control the whole distribution sale uh, chain, I mean, producers, um, you know, that 
that could be problematic. Um, and it's also a way, because of product tracking, at least in some states, spoiled or recall alcohol can be quickly identified and pulled from the shelves. Um, so I think it's really important to understand this. It took me a long time to get my head around this three-tier system, I will admit. Um, but I think you know, it's really come clear. And I have to say, in Wisconsin yesterday, our state assembly passed a bill that is allowing some slippage of investment into the different tiers. And we're, you know, we're very concerned about seeing that. Um, and again, that domination of the market um, and potentially more aggressive sales. So we've got a changing landscape. So COVID led to a lot of things. And I know everyone's kind of tired about talking about COVID. I'm just going to put that out there. But I think we have to discuss it to understand kind of where we sit today. Um, and so the beginning of COVID um, certainly led to a lot of social isolation. You saw stress, I would have to say, as someone with kids, um, definitely. And unfortunately, my kids were older, but I know talking to other people with young kids, it was a big stress on both parents or on the mom or on the dad, depending on, you know, the situation. Um, and then there was this big concern about small business viability, right? Um, what are we going to do because all of these businesses are shut down? And you had lawmakers that were anxious to do something about that. Um, and, you, you know, I work a lot with public health, but we've also got some fantastic coalitions that do substance use work. Um, and if they were associated with the health department or a clinic, they were often pulled, right, in order to deal with COVID. And so there was kind of, people were distracted. Um, so it, it kind of created some opportunities for the alcohol industry, right? So public health also, um, a lot of the health officers I've talked to, they didn't want to be too vocal about what might be happening, even though, you know, in our state, alcohol is one of the top three issues uh, when they do community assessments, the chips and the jaws and all of those things. Um, because they were under fire because they were the ones, you know, closing businesses down. And um, obviously, I think we've seen some real backlash to that. So there was this feeling like we can't speak out too much about this. Um, and that's where, you know, when you build strong coalitions, um, it, there's a reason for that. And that's one of them. So you don't have just one organization or um, folks talking about that when there's this crazy opportunity for the alcohol industry to advance their agenda. So what were some of those policy changes? Um, and I'd also be interested if folks wanted to share as we go through this, some of what happened to them. Um, they opened for on-premise consumption, right? Um, even though we know that in closed spaces, people were transmitting COVID, um, but then there was this open for takeout and curbside pickup um, and for alcohol, not just for food. Um, and then there was the additional outdoor space to sell and serve alcohol um, so that restaurants could provide additional, you know, kind of safer locations um, for people so they wouldn't go out of business, right? So that was the whole um, part about that. So have folks shared a little bit in the chat um, about some of the off-premise or on-premise? You're muted, Erin. Sorry. Um, uh, so I'm seeing just a couple of responses that alcohol being served in movie theaters. Interesting. Yeah, so that's different in a kind of changing where alcohol is served um, in an on-premise way. Other, um, anyone else saw changes did you see these changes, right? So uh, in Michigan, there was a lot of outdoor drinking spaces made during the pandemic. Absolutely, this additional outdoor space uh, for serving alcohol. Yeah, we saw that in Michigan. Uh, I believe Ohio had a whole structure in which they created open, uh, open environments for people to sit outside and drink uh, alcohol. It looks like there's movie theaters in Ohio already had alcohol. 
Uh, oh yeah, the, so the so Amber's sharing with us that the creation of social districts where you can drink outside with specific cups in certain town areas. Amber, are you in Ohio? Um, and then cocktails to go started in Michigan during during uh, COVID. Uh, outdoor drinking spaces again. Let's see. City council tried to pass containers, open containers in parks, but it didn't pass. Well, that's oh, so Amber, you're in Michigan, so you had that same kind of like social there's like a, a a name for them and i can't remember what it is Dora, um, isn't it yeah Dora? is that it uh, yeah um yep our city just enacted a dora resident <laughs> designated recreation area um in indiana um so yeah we saw a lot of those pop up um battle creek has one um texas does have movie theaters serving alcohol as well as you can find some parks that are becoming BYOB, interesting. Yes, Texas movie theaters. I have seen that. Agree, uh, outdoor space was utilizing street space. Um, Barbara says, you didn't see these ones. Movie theaters had alcohol already. Cocktails to go came about during COVID. So that um, pickup, right? That pickup for an open container or a, a, a cocktail. Um, Dora spaces in uh, Ohio are popping up. Um, Wine with, oh my, wine with DeWine is coined. <laughs> so who's the, <laughs> the governor there? Uh, the pedal bars. Oh, John, where are you at? I have seen those, right? Um, where they're like bikes that like you sit at at a table and pedal and there's alcohol and someone else is kind of driving it and you're all pedaling it. John, are you in Wisconsin? It looks like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, drunk driving accidents and arrests went up. Galveston Island has uh, pedal drunk buggy. Oh, yay. Pedal bars. I, I have seen them once or twice and just like kind of blown away by that concept. Um, so, uh, great. Okay. Well, y'all, this is really amazing. Thank you for sharing all of this. I think I have a couple more thoughts. Uh, Florida has movie theaters. Uh, movie theaters were closed during COVID, so I've seen that more they're reopening. Uh, they're having alcohol to get people back into the theaters. Um, restaurants can sell alcohol to go, which we're seeing here in, in your list, um, but not does not have specific containers, right? So someone said earlier there were specific containers that they had to serve alcohol in. So yeah, so lots of different uh, ways that that popped up, but I think we heard a lot, Maureen, about this additional outdoor spaces and pickup yep. and different on-premise locations. Right, and I think a lot of those were designed to be for short term. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about whether that actually happened or not. Um, <clears throat> and then off-premise. Um, so the whole essential business, like alcohol stores were deemed essential um, in, um, in many states, um, certainly in Wisconsin. And then the delivery of alcohol to consumers' homes. Um, so just kind of a, a variety of off-premise, you know, um, which means, you know, the stores basically, um, you know, so you weren't drinking it there, um, but that, you know, you could certainly still go to the liquor store. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I did want to just mention, there was an interesting article um, and I, I have it in the notes somewhere. So it'll be part of your references. Um, South Africa did something interesting, they uh, did not allow alcohol sales. Um, and they did not have that because they didn't want people gathering. So their death rate and ER visits from alcohol related issues decreased significantly. And they had more capacity to take some of those COVID patients. However, it caused obviously people, you know, with their business having a lot of trouble um, going out of business and, and that kind of thing. So there's, um, you know, like hitting that middle ground, I think is really difficult, but it's interesting how their death rates essentially, as I recall from the article, 
but don't quote me, <laughs> kind of remained steady where other people's went up because you had not only had the alcohol related deaths, you also had COVID where they were diminishing the alcohol related deaths. And then COVID kind of kept their death rates um, around the same place. So kind of an interesting natural experiment, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we saw around the world. So, so Maureen, um, I'm seeing in the chat a little bit um, about uh, some questions and some comments. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting that um, Danielle brings up is that when working in people with, when working with people in recovery, uh, it's become more challenging to find activities and spaces that do not have alcohol sales um, as that kind of expanded into those recreational areas and we kind of expanded where or when we could drink. Um, someone uh, uh, looks like uh, Dibby is asking why essential. And I think we know that the alcohol industry pushed for those businesses to be deemed essential. We also know that um, people were really concerned about the local businesses in their areas. Um, so uh, that's likely a lot of why in different areas, there were different reasons that they were deemed um, essential. Grocery stores in Florida are making bars inside to shop and drink. We have a couple of those here in Illinois. Um, wonderful. So I think the other piece here is, is that what we've seen, and while some of this relates to the on-premise, it also we saw an increase in COVID people drinking in their homes and as opposed to drinking in uh, on-premise establishments like bars and restaurants or movie theaters, as it were. Um, so this continues this open, this delivery of alcohol to consumers in the state of Illinois, where I am, if the business was deemed essential, then they were allowed to deliver during lockdown. If you were not essential, you could not deliver. So for example, our toy store in town wanted to deliver uh, toys and games, but was not able to because they were not deemed essential. So that essential designation was really important in order for the alcohol distributor, the, the alcohol sales to, to get to consumers' homes directly. So um, yeah, and so that the consumption of alcohol really moved into the home more. I mean, everything moved into the home, but uh, and and stayed there in the aftermath of lockdown. Um, I'm sorry. I just also wanted to say that yeah, someone has please. said there's been an uptick in allowance uh, in the airport where you're allowed to walk around with open containers. Oh, great, wonderful. Uh, they added alcohol to the Cracker Barrel, so some businesses are adding alcohol. Um, that may be so that they can get that designation or so that they can uh, expand that delivery um, during lockdown or end after. So great. Thanks for all that insight, y'all. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Maureen. Cause... Okay. One of the things I was going to say about those essential businesses, I think we probably all read press about this mom and pop place that has worked hard, you know, and looks like they're going to lose everything during COVID, you know, those stories kept coming up in terms of why, you know, they should be able to, to do these other things with alcohol, right? So that didn't happen by accident. Think about the story that they told. Um, and that story speaks to us. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things that I'm going to talk kind of through this a little bit, where we do need to be able to tell the stories um, and share the data, where they're just telling stories um, and not sharing additional data as to, you know, essentially why they want these kind of things to happen. So moving on, I want to talk just briefly about the alcohol industry tactics. So these kind of COVID-related policies we're already being worked on, you know, it, I mean, I cannot believe how fast so many legislators across the legislatures across the country suddenly had these policies. Well, it clearly means that there was communication and readiness by the alcohol industry to pass these kinds of things. They were trying to pass them anyway. Um, but it, it suddenly, you know, you got a lot more momentum um, when they saw this opportunity. Um, and 
there has been kind of this movement towards less restrictive alcohol access, and that's been going on for a long time. Um, I would say, you know, many states have seen this over the last decade or two um, in terms of loosening the um, alcohol access. And think about the alcohol industry, you know, donating to um, political campaigns. So, um, you know, that I think is part of this conversation. It may not be those small stores doing that, but, you know, Bacardi and Molson Coors and, you know, some of those others are active in our state legislatures, certainly. Um, and just being ready for opportunities. So that's something I think we need to think about is when we're ready for opportunities, you know, to keep working towards change. Um, and sometimes there's an opportunity that we should definitely take advantage of. Um, also, there's some interesting research that nearly all of the alcohol industry's drinking and driving initiatives have been rated either ineffective ineffective or unknown. So when I was talking before about um, this focus on um, impaired driving laws, then the alcohol industry is pushing some of these things, right? And they're ineffective, or at least they haven't shown enough effectiveness to get to the known column. Um, so, and that comes from um, the, at National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, so again, we have these references for you um, in there. And then um, just looking through some industry publications, we find that there have been hundreds of millions of dollars donated um, by the alcohol industry to our politicians. I'm sure that's not a big surprise. Um, you know, and in one of the articles I was reading, it, they were kind of shaming their part of the industry for not doing more, um, you know, like it's a competition. So we saw a lot of changes in alcohol consumption. Again, I know you know this, um, but we're gonna talk about kind of the perfect storm. So you had these policy changes going on, we had the lockdowns and so, people are struggling. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of unknown going on. Um, you know, there's taking care of kids, trying to work, you know, and, and manage lives that are very difficult. And then there's this concern that businesses um, are going to be problematic. So what's the answer? Increasing that access and availability of alcohol, right? Um, and so we're we're moving in the wrong direction because we're continuing to see a rise in alcohol-related deaths. And as we know, a lot of that changed significantly in, during COVID. Um, so it really created that perfect storm um, of going in the wrong direction. And then the impact of alcohol consumption. So um, we see some drinking that did decrease. Some people drank the same. And then you see other people that, um, their drinking increased quite a bit. Um, we know from um, our Wisconsin data, and I would venture to guess that you probably have the same thing. You started seeing deaths rise very quickly. You know, so the lockdown goes, you know, what, mid to late March. And we started to see those death rates really going up starting in June. So it didn't take that long, um, which I think is, shows how much more drinking was going on and um, how people weren't getting the health care, um, you know, as well, because there was a lot of restrictions on that. So what, what opportunities were there? There's all this national news about alcohol deaths spiking. Um, and people are taking, you know, talking about all these statistics. Um, and I just wonder, and so I have another question for you all. Were you able to take advantage of some of this press? Were you able to get some news stories out there kind of talking about the harm of excessive alcohol use um, and helping to define that? So I'd be interested 
were people able to take advantage of some of this new attention about the rate of alcohol-related deaths um, going on? So Erin, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if folks were able to share. Yeah, I am watching the chat. And if you could just repeat the question again so that we're all, sure. yeah. Right, so um, as we saw those alcohol deaths rise very quickly, you know, generally speaking, it was about a 25% increase. Um, there was a lot of press that happened of that. And so what I'm wondering is, were you able to take advantage of the press by talking about excessive alcohol use and its harms and mm -hmm. maybe even talking about policy? You know, was that, was, did that create an opportunity for you? Mm -hmm. Or like many people, you had a lot going on with COVID and weren't necessarily able to take advantage of that. Um, great, so some we're hearing, um, not directly, I wouldn't say there was a chance to take advantage of the press because there was too much else to be worried about. Absolutely, um, I think one of the things that we saw was is that we, most of us couldn't focus on that. The alcohol industry took very solid advantage of the fact that we were distracted by other public health issues and other um, personal issues about lockdown and, and the like. Um, so we see, I see a couple more no's. One of the things I will point out is a lot of these stories are stories that are coming out in the past year, um, less during lockdown. So they're now looking at um, data from the period of lockdown and, and right after. So that's six months to a year after uh, March, 2020. So some of this, um, some of, of, uh, of this information is just coming out now. Um, so Carla said that there, uh, she did provide alcohol education while working with clients in a health clinic. That's great. Um, just getting that information out to individuals. Um, some uh, so on social media, Julie, that's great. So kind of getting the message out about alcohol deaths on social media and sharing some of this information. Um, Paige says they're highlighting it now, showing the after effects of alcohol during COVID and it has, um, it was hard to do it during, you know, when we were completely kind of rethinking our approaches, right? We were all pivoting, as we keep saying, uh, during that time. So doing it then, uh, but now having this data and looking back, it seems like Paige is saying she's able to do that now. Um, I know some people, so Ashley's sharing that she knows some people were using more, but I think it was, just, we were distracted by COVID news more and never saw this information. Um, don't be embarrassed that you didn't know. Actually, like all of us were kind of, uh, there, were, there were very few people who were aware of exactly what was happening with alcohol policy. Uh, it was happening very much under the radar. Um, so don't, don't feel bad. What we know now is that those policies were changes and these, this data is what we're starting to see. So like I said, so you'll notice on these clips that these, the dateline on these are all in 2022, meaning that they're looking at data from during that period. And now, now we know more about the impact of that uh, changes in alcohol consumption patterns and policies. So anyone else had the opportunity to use this? Um, so Ashley didn't see the information on the spike in death rates. Yeah, I think that's a little bit more recent um, in that, you know, in the last six months, uh, we've started to see that information come out. Uh, anything else, Maureen? I'm not seeing other comments in the chat. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, there's still studies coming out um, about this. And so think of those as an opportunity as you're thinking about um, policy as an opportunity to speak out, whether it's on social media or using um, earned media, which is, you know, newspapers and radio, TV, you, you know, to be able to talk about the message. Um, you know, I've always felt like it's important to elevate the issues, even though it might not be around the exact thing that you're working on. Um, if you can elevate the issue about alcohol and overconsumption, excessive alcohol use, and what can happen, that's to the good. And you can, if you're, you know, kind of statewide, you can provide some, I call it cover for local coalitions that are doing this work. Um, local coalitions can benefit from this as well to kind of revitalize interests or to make sure to their local community that they realize what a big problem this is. So just kind of 
stick that in your head. And when you see some of those stories, um, it would be important to then think about, is there an opportunity to use this? Is there an opportunity for an, um, an op-ed, you know, like writing to the paper and, and saying something or a blog or, you know, those kinds of things um, to kind of get the message out. Mm -hmm. Great. And I see the one of the things I saw that I think is really interesting is Shannon shared that her clinic was watching uh, and the increase in alcohol sales by watching tax on alcohol increases. So the tax income increase. That's a really interesting kind of mm -hmm. almost real time way to see what's happening. Um, you know, it leaves some gaps, but it gives you some nice proxy around what's happening with alcohol consumption. So if there's more sales, there's more consumption. What that looks like, uh, we started to get into later, but that's a great, I love that as a real time approach. Yes, that is a great approach. Um, and generally speaking, you can get that information from, you know, your Department of Revenue or taxation or whoever does that um, in your state. The challenge is getting it broken down to a local level. That's really tough, but um, maybe some of your control states do that. Um, and then what we wanted to show with this slide is, you know, if you look till from 2009 to 2019, we see this slow, steady rise in alcohol-related deaths. And so the states that are listed here are part of the Great Lakes region. Um, so we didn't anticipate um, Oregon or New Mexico or some of the other folks that are on here. Um, but in terms of the Midwest, this is what we saw. And then you see this giant spike. You see 2021 going up. And we have yet to see um, all of the data from 2022, but it doesn't look like it's going down. Like we're not going back down to 2019 levels. It may, you know, go down a little bit in 2022, but again, we're still way above um, where we were. Um, <clears throat> and then we wanted to break down um, by gender, um, just kind of seen overall. Um, obviously, males are impacted greatly um, by alcohol-induced deaths, which are a variety of, of things that happen. So we generally saw 7% increases between 2000 and 2018. Um, and then when you looked at alcohol age-adjusted rate, you saw that jump in 2019 to 2020 by 26%. Um, rates of alcohol-induced deaths for males were stable. Um, you know, you see this line here, it, it doesn't, it does go up and not as much. Um, and you see that increase 30% um, over time. Um, and then you saw 20, so that's over 10 years, right? And then in one year, you saw a 26% increase. Alcohol-induced deaths for females increased over time with the largest annual increase of 27% between 2019 and 2020. Um, the difference between male and female deaths started to close or decrease um, you know, from 3.6 times higher for males to 2.6 times higher. So that means women were catching up basically and having higher death rates. And there was a report that came out yesterday um, that shows the higher death rates and breaks them down even further. So again, we're still getting this data um, and it showed um, you know, the, the increase. And I wanna just read to you kind of what happened in particular from February, 2020 to January of 2021 alcohol-induced mortality increased 43% for males, 53% for females, 107% for um, American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, and that was followed by Blacks increasing 58%, Hispanics 56, Asians 44, and non-Hispanic whites by 39. Now wow. I know it's hard to listen to data being read to you, but you can see these really gigantic jumps um, for uh, American Indian, Alaska Natives, Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians above the white population. And 
I there are a couple of comments in the chat that I just want to draw attention to and Paige is sharing that they saw a very large increase in alcohol use among girls, uh, especially teenage girls and there's some thought maybe that they are mirroring their mother's uh, behavior mommy wine time was pretty big during COVID, that um, women's drinking um, in the home increased, uh, and maybe that there was a mirroring impact that were, you know, again, the ripples that we're still starting to see. So yep. Paige, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then Lisa shared, and I think this is really, uh, really interesting, is that in some places uh, that employers had uh, and still have happy hours, uh, virtual happy hours with folks logging into virtual meetings, having drinks and networking, again, drinking from their homes instead of uh, in uh, establishments. So more likely to engage in uh, those happy hours and networking to connect with their peers and their colleagues. Right. Um, and, you know, bars, you see them pulling out a um, distilled spirit, you know, vodka or gin or whatever, and they have those measuring things, right? So they measure the amount of alcohol. Um, we've talked in our office a little bit about how maybe we're not measuring at home as much. And so maybe one glass of wine is actually more than one serving. Um, so just something to keep in mind um, in terms of, you know, what we're, we're seeing. Um, so the next slide, we talk about the impact on women's health. Um, and, uh, you know, so the first here, you've got women under 50, the blue is pre-COVID and the orange is during COVID. So you saw that jump, um, women over 50. And, you know, there's a lot of um, issues with alcohol liver disease. Um, and if there's high intensity drinking, that can lead to a much more rapid onset of um, alcohol liver disease. So some of these things take a long time like cancer, um, but some can be rapidly increased with high intensity drinking. So that's a new term that came out um, in terms of high intensity drinking that you're seeing people drink, not just a binge drink, which is that four to five drinks within a couple of hours, but more that eight to 10 or even higher um, drinks that are happening and what that can do um, to people in terms of rapidly increasing their um, disease and obviously mortality. And then um, we have the breakdown of males. Um, and so then you see the pre-COVID level of men over 50 and actually during COVID decreasing. Um, so this comes from a large multi-hospital analysis and demonstrates that concern with the gender disparity with women and especially young women. So that feeds into the comment you made, Pam, in terms of what you're seeing with um, girls as well. So I think um, there's more research and study to be done in that area, um, you know, to help us understand that and hopefully help um, reverse some of these trends. So ongoing impact, um, you know, this continues to impact consumption patterns. Um, so we're not really seeing that return to pre-COVID levels. Um, and the long-term impact of the lockdown in terms of health outcomes in the future, uh, you know, uh, we work with a variety of folks, um, you know, the liver transplant team, um, folks who work in oncology and cancer, and they're saying there's gonna be a long tail on some of this, right? That they've done a significant amount of damage during the lockdown, during COVID. Um, and even if they bring their drinking down, that we're still going to see the tail on this over the next decade, which is, is really, um, you know, kind of startling, I think. Um, and then we had the policy changes that are increasing access, increasing availability, and how much is that helping to keep those levels, consumption patterns higher? Um, so just, you know, I wanted also just to give folks a chance to share um, about that. Like, have you seen consumption go down in your state? Have you seen mortality trends? I know what's happening kind of in Wisconsin and nationally, but not necessarily in different states. 
um, and if folks have, have seen any changes. I know we keep asking you questions, but I think this is um, an area where we're still learning, um, you know, what the impact is and kind of what the aftermath is. Great. Uh, yeah, so one, just wanting to know what other ongoing impacts we've heard some people um, just saying that like there's not been a reverse in the policies that were passed during COVID. So heard some of that already. Um, some other people are just unsure of what that ongoing impact looks like. Um, continued, uh, so Julie's sharing that like the continuing ongoing impact is that consumption has increased um, and avail availability still remains uh, higher than it was. Um, uh, I think someone, uh, Molly's sharing that uh, post COVID there's been an increase in non-alcoholic beverages in more locations. Um, interesting, can you, can you say more about that in the chat, Molly? And then anyone else who has any like other impacts that you've seen in Iowa continues to increase consumption and availability just still going up. So not even leveled out, just still going up. Um, uh, alcohol related deaths are just about matching our drug related deaths on a monthly basis. Mary Beth, thank you so much for sharing that. That's pretty, that's pretty jarring to see that uh, raised to that level. Um, I'm sure for everyone, uh, others. Other things to add? Great. Well, I mean, I think we're, again, like I said earlier, you know, this is a ripple, like the, the change hit the water and we're, we're going to be seeing this ripple effect for a long time. Um, and what we're, what we're, we're, you know, we don't know yet um, at the community level, at the state level at the national level we're just continuing to learn more and more about what's going on um oh so someone's saying that there's a lot out, yeah, the dry bar in columbus i've actually been there nicole uh when i was at a conference um so yes there are more names that wanted to kind of get into this availability of alcohol and into kind of this sober curious state uh space and so um the um there's more kind of mocktails. And actually I, I noticed this recently uh, here in Illinois that there's more kind of non-alcoholic beverages and mocktails available um, to kind of get other people engaged in that, that drinking culture that seems to be everywhere. There's a dry bar in Iowa. I'm sorry to hear that the one in Columbus went out of business. They made me a really nice vegan burger. Um, <laughs> so great. Uh, Wonderful. And the, so Mary Beth is saying that the count, uh, the state continues to change laws that allow more accessibility. Um, I know that there's also states where they're starting to um, take those what were temporary laws and, and um, institutionalize them and make them permanent. So great. I'm going to turn it back over to you. So we've definitely seen where they keep the laws or, um, you know, it was supposed to be a sunset, um, but they didn't set a date. So some of those, you know, city councils, um, we have a lot of local control in Wisconsin are asking like, well, wait a minute, when are we going back um, to before this? Or, you know, we can't just continually have all of these outdoor areas. Um, there's some challenges that they've had. So that um, access to alcohol, of course, we're seeing continued harms and death that changes to that three-tiered system that we talked about earlier certainly could um, result in unintentional consequences. Um, <clears throat> and then we're seeing in our state this conversation about shifting the liability from the retailer to the delivery company. So if you've got home delivery, be interesting to know where that liability is. Um, and that home delivery can make the minimum age drinking laws more difficult to enforce. So instead of thinking about the number of alcohol places, you know, and going there, um, you think about the delivery that can happen not only to homes, but to apartments and dorms and campgrounds. And, you know, so that can be more complicated and more expensive in order to make sure like alcohol age compliance checks are happening um, in that delivery process. So how do we turn the tide? I kind of feel like sad right now. 
but there's some action steps that um, can definitely happen. So we did um, talk about this um, in the first webinar, making sure that we're identifying the problem in the community and the problem that pe people have the energy to solve, I think is really important. Um, building that leadership buy-in and by leadership, not only do I wanna just make sure we're talking about the community comes first, right? And those who are most impacted by these changes and by excessive alcohol use, putting them in front. Um, but then also building that leadership buy-in. Do you have the hospital CEO? Um, do you have any companies that are seeing changes that they wanna see go back, right? That more of their employees are, you know, binge drinking the night before and not productive, or there's more injury, you know? So you wanna build that leadership um, in your communities and understanding where you make that change. And then of course, identifying who makes those decisions, which is sometimes a little bit more fuzzy than we think. Um, sometimes you need to go to city council. Sometimes you need the chief of police or the sheriff um, to do that. So it's really important to make sure where you make those changes. So I believe we have a poll in my correct in that? Excellent. Um, hey, so here we go. We have this poll to ask what alcohol pain changes did you see? So we've already talked about this a little bit, but I um, wanted to kind of get just a, a like a numeric measurable uh, feel on this. So did you see a change in legislation uh, to change alcohol delivery laws, uh, allow the pickup of cocktails. Um, oops, it looks like you can only choose one, and I'm not sure if we're able to change that on the fly. Um, so I apologize for that. It looks like um, all of the above, says Ashley. Um, it doesn't look like we can change that. I apologize. I, I made that setting incorrect, um, but it looks like others. So if you want to, if you want to just say other and respond in the chat, that's fine. All of the above. Um, Cocktail, pick up cocktails is what I'm seeing, alcohol delivery, um, and changes to areas, um, a lot of all of the above. These all happened for people. Um, yeah, that, and that definitely changes that landscape of what alcohol policy looks like. And we had someone uh, right before we started the poll say that indeed that their state had made COVID loss permanent um, and are allowing, allowing younger servers to serve alcohol in restaurants and uh, retail establishments. Um, yeah, N Nebraska had already had delivery, but it exploded and expanded during COVID. Whether I'm not sure uh, if you're indicating that that was like legislatively it expanded or exploded or just like the use of that alcohol delivery increased. Um, alcohol has, or alcohol, sorry, Wisconsin has proposed for 14 year olds to be able to serve alcohol. That's, it's awesome. Mildly insane. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the, the, the fallout of COVID kind of continues in this way that we don't expect, right? So now we have this kind of employment issue um, where we, uh, many, many establishments are, um, are understaffed and this becomes an issue, right? They, they don't have people to, who can actually serve alcohol who are 21 or over. Um, and now we're looking at, they're looking at changing those, those laws. So uh, fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. And again, Maureen, wildly above all the above is what we're seeing here in this poll. So thank you so much. Yes, I, I just scanned through and I couldn't believe how many said all of the above. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there is a lot of work um, that we need to be doing. Um, and there was another one about a bartender. Yeah, so um, Hannah, I thank you for sharing. She's a bartender at 18 and even though it was a legal age to serve uh, in Michigan, she's looking back and realizing that's crazy. I was a minor and had no idea truly about the effects of consumption. So it'd be really hard to like understand what it would be to overserve someone if you have really no idea. Uh, that, that's really interesting. Michigan, they lowered the age to 17 after COVID. Um, 
but uh, this is interesting that you're saying that that uh, they're still concerned about liability, so they're not really willing to hire um, and use folks at that age to serve alcohol. And I wonder if that kind of goes back to Hannah saying, at that age, I just didn't really understand. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting juxtaposition. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Maureen, let's turn it back to you and see. Great. So how do we make these changes, right? Um, <clears throat> so as we've definitely defined the problem, right? Um, and then we've got to think about what kind of solutions and changes are needed. Um, and one of the things I think is really important is to think about the people that need to make these changes. Um, so I like to tell a little bit of a story. Um, so my background is in tobacco policy. And I remember meeting with folks um, and talking about the changes and one of them was um, a tavern owner, uh, but he was on the um, county board, right? And so the county was looking at making some changes. But this guy had a pompadour, like this isn't that long ago, right? He had a pompadour, which kind of went out in the 60s. <laughs> and, you know, like how he dressed and the language, you know what I mean? Like, so some people are really open to change and other people are kind of stuck back in 1985. So it's just kind of another lens to look at the bodies that you're gonna to need to work with, meaning the governing, the board of health, um, you know, the police chief, you know, it's just one of those things you need to think about, like, how are they about change? Um, now, obviously there's been a lot of changes, but, we know that some of that comes from a pat on the back and good old boy club kinds of stuff. So we need to really think about what kind of things are needed and building relationships with key partners. Now, not only do you need the community coming first, um, but you also need to know who do decision makers listen to? And so who can you make friends with? So I think it's really important to make a lot of friends. Um, and build those relationships. Um, so, and making sure that you have a policy strategy um, is important. We're gonna talk more about that um, in the next webinar, but I think it's critical to have a strategy. And one of the ideal ways to really come up with strategy is when you're not under fire, right? Um, and the reason I say that is because during the heat of moving policy forward, whether it's you know really a full-blown policy campaign or that you're working with kind of that systems change where you're trying to make sure that the police are doing alcohol age compliance checks or collecting place of last drink or you know whatever else is already on the books, but actually getting them to do it and collect that data and make sure we can see what's happening. Um, you wanna have that solid strategy mapped out not in the heat of the moment, but when you're sane, right? Because in the heat of these things, we sometimes don't make good decisions, right? And so it's important to have a solid strategy, um, you know, as we're, we're moving forward. Because if you stick to the strategy and you stick to your guns in terms of how many people you need in order to raise their hand and say, we wanna see this change, um, thinking about, you know, how you do that, your media strategy, your kind of friend to friend strategy. And I, you know, kind of put that in quotes, but some of those high level folks um, that need to hear it from somebody else in their kind of stratosphere um, is really important. And obviously on the community level, making sure that we're having communities talk to themselves, talk to other communities, um, looking for that support to change. And we know that there's so much going on. It's hard to pull folks out to say, you know what, alcohol is driving a lot of this and we need you to think about that and, you know, want your support. Taking advantage of awareness through the media and, you know, the big charm here is being persistent. Um, and it's tiring. It is exhausting working on these kinds of policies. So, I, I should have said be persistent and also take care of yourself so that you do have the energy um, and the drive to move forward. 
So reversing these policies, harnessing the current media coverage um, on these topics. I, you know, there's more data that's coming out. Um, there's more studies that come out, and that's a real opportunity to jump and talk to reporters about what's happening. Um, it doesn't mean that you're lobbying when you're um, working with the media, unless you tell through the media someone to vote for or against a policy. But if you are sharing information and data about what's going on, that's not lobbying, and you can take advantage of that media coverage. Um, other sectors, you know, don't really know what happened. Even some folks on the phone call were like, we weren't aware of these big trends. We didn't see these news articles in early 2020 on, you know, what was happening. That's totally understandable. But that gives you an opportunity to go back and educate people about what has happened and what is the impact of these policy changes. Um, and just, again, building new relationships. Um, and I know sometimes people get intimidated by having to go and talk to people um, from, a, you know, and for a variety of different reason, reasons to build on um, some of these emerging issues. But once you start doing it, you'll find that it's often really well received and people know something's going on um, and you're helping them articulate it. Um, and so, you know, again, use the information and use that to build support, um, you know, for change and having some of that goal is really helpful. One of the biggest challenges I think sometimes is working in public health or substance use areas is that we sometimes like, well, this is more important or that's more important. And, you know, and then there's a lot of back and forth. No, we got to do it this way. And there's a lot of like inner fighting that's going on. Um, and trust me, the alcohol industry fights among themselves, but they also have figured out how not to fight on some things. We have to do the same thing. We have to focus on the overall goal and make sure that everybody is engaged and everybody has a place, right? Um, everyone has a job to do and that when we can take credit collectively, you know, someone gets in the news, that's great, right? They're moving the ball forward. So it's, um, I just see over time that there's all of these discussions and it's like, you gotta get out of that space. The rest of the public has no idea what's going on and they need to hear from you. So you've got to figure out how to, how to push through that and, and move forward. So on the, on the good side of this, we're actually seeing some states having either discussions or approving major updates. You know, Alaska has been working on, um, for the last decade, major changes to alcohol laws. And these have been um, really very positive. Um, they're kind of a case study in terms of how to, how to do this. You see um, New Mexico making major strides. Now I know folks from New Mexico might feel like, yeah, we haven't gotten all the way there yet, but the conversations um, that are being discussed, um, changes in liquor laws, you know, it, it, we're seeing some real positive, again, a lot from that drumbeat of the media and great work on the local level from what I can see from Wisconsin, right? Um, and then just, can we talk about increasing alcohol taxes? Um, I know Washington State is another one that's doing that. So it's really exciting that there are bright spots in all of this. So I also want you to feel optimistic. We can do this. We can make change. It's gonna take time. It's gonna take resources, um, but this comes from longstanding coalitions, you know, that have figured out how to get funding, how to advocate for these changes. Um, and they, you know, there's some lobbying involved, but they've got the research behind them. They've been educating the public on this and they're changing the narrative in their state. So when I think about um, the long-term change, um, thinking about that strong coalition of partners, and that doesn't mean a list. That means people that want to do something about it. 
So, you know, thinking about, um, and again, we'll talk more about this um, in the next webinar, but thinking about those coalition partners who should be at the table and making sure they have jobs to do. Having a clear strategy of how you're gonna do this, um, using data to make decisions and build support. I think that comes as second nature to folks in our field. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and when I think about um, educating the public and policymakers, I think about how we generally talk in different terms. We're trying to bring people together, right? We're trying to find common ground, you know, have a good strategy, have the, have the research to back up what we want to say. But policymakers live in a competitive world. Um, and so people are really have a different metric that they put success. Like we're happy when we have a larger coalition or more people engaged where they're looking at the competition and having the right people engaged. Excuse me while my dog is um, unhappy at the moment. I hope you guys can't hear her growling. Um, <clears throat> so we look at data um, and they're looking at how do they have this um, bumper sticker for their next campaign? How do they make that slogan? How do they say what they've done in the shortest possible way? Um, and so it's really changing that narrative on issues. So there's this dominant narrative, you know, and um, we just, it's so fresh in my mind of watching all this testimony in Wisconsin and, and the chairman of this committee gets up and says, you know, in the past, the alcohol industry has come to us and wants us to pick among friends. <laughs> So the whole alcohol industry is friendly with our legislature. You know, that's what that says. Instead of thinking about alcohol in Wisconsin kills more than twice the amount of people than opioids. Right? So how do we change the narrative so that we can kind of push back on that dominant narrative that everything the alcohol industry wants is good, you know, um, and public health or, you know, coalitions, you know, don't have that kind of say. So a lot of what those coalitions that I showed you have done is working to change that narrative on the issue. Um, and then it's, of course, being able to be persistent. And that doesn't mean um, becoming shrill, right? It's um, thinking about this persistent advocacy doesn't mean that it's, you know, maybe you're the leader of the coalition, that it's always you, right? It means that you've also figured out how to get other people to help carry this message. So the persistence is coming from a group, um, from people that vote for people, uh, you know, that really can help make that long-term change. So after all of that, um, what kind of next steps do you all have in the next 30 days? So I'm going to shift it back to you, Erin. Yeah. So as you think about, oh, that the, the slide looks weird. Sorry. Uh, as you think about what is next, what, what are your next steps um, after learning all this, after hearing what we've heard today from Maureen and from your colleagues, your peers on the call, what do you think about, like, what's the next step for you? What uh, what can you do in the next 30 days to start a process of addressing these issues? Um, what resources do you need? Um, who do you need to assist in that work? And what, what uh, can't see it under that picture? That is really lovely. I missed that. Um, so in the chat, share with us kind of what you're hoping to do to take this work forward in the next, you know, 30 days. We can even say in the next week. Um, what, what are you going to do? Right, so I know some people said that they weren't aware of this, so maybe your first step is to do some research and find out uh, what happened in Ashland County, Wisconsin, was selected to participate in the Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Project. So that's great, and Maureen's 
smiling wide. So that's a great um, step to move forward with that work. Um, some of this could be about applying for funding or about um, working with your community um, to educate. So um, thank you, uh, Shana, for putting that in the chat. So what are your next steps to make change? What do you need to take that next step? So what, what is it you need to even move forward? Um, and what do you need to, um, who, what partners might you need, what resources? So thinking about those next steps, maybe it's, I need to bring someone else on board from some other, some, another agency, another, um, another group in my, uh, my community, or is it that you, uh, you need resources so you're applying for funds? Is it that you um, need someone, you need the support of your supervisors? Um, so if you want to just in the chat again, if I'm looking to see kind of what you think, what's my next step, right? And maybe, you know, just maybe we can think about how this or how this learning can start to apply in our um, so Kelly's going to, uh, look at data about alcohol deaths and share that with, uh, with the local newspaper. That's great. So to get that information out, uh, continue to learn so we can properly educate our participants, increase community capacity to do prevention work. This is all hugely important, right? Um, so yeah, so start to just build our own understanding, build the community's understanding, bring back uh, awareness to the issue with health fairs, community education events, uh, working with city councils and board of supervisors to implement new ordin ordinances around merchant training, um, when they fail compliance checks, that's a great, that's wonderful, um, and helping to implement compliance checks, um, attend and participate in alcohol work group in my community coalition, great, thank Julie, that's wonderful. Um, Another great next step would be to come to the webinar next week that Maureen's going to be doing on demystifying the implementation of alcohol policy work. Um, Amanda says uh, she's be working to making more connections with local government and increasing our capacity to share data with community members. Great. So like making those connections is a really good first step and then providing them and increasing their information, building a, a, a cadre or a collection of folks in your community who can also share this information. So it's not just coming from you, like it's coming from other folks in the community, it's coming from your coalition members. Uh, that's fantastic. I mean, I love that approach. And so starting to think about maybe putting some small goals on your calendar around how you're going to do that, where you're going to go, what you need to do that. Um, I saw a couple comments in the chat about um, establishment owners that I'd like to talk oh, about yeah, a little please. bit more. That was uh, earlier. Yep. Yeah. And so you know, some of those owners, you know, might be helpful, um, but you just have to consider that they may also, there may be cross purposes, right? Because if their business is profiting from alcohol sales, um, you just have to take that into consideration. Um, and so I just want to give you an example of something that didn't work for a long time. Um, and I think this was across the country, but we certainly saw it in our area where, you know, when we're talking about the smoke-free air laws, um, people worked on getting smoke-free dining guides, you know, getting uh, restaurants to go smoke-free voluntarily, you know, and all of that. To my knowledge, not a single one of those owners ever came to city council and said, everyone else should do the same thing. Why? Because they had found a niche right, in their business. And so they were committed in their own business to create a healthier environment by not allowing smoking. Um, but that didn't translate into the larger policy change that is going to affect more people. So just, you know, as you're working with business owners, just think about that in terms of how far you can go with it. Um, and, and is that your ultimate goal? Um, I think running alcohol age compliance checks is absolutely fantastic. I think um, ensuring those who fail um, are getting additional um, responsible beverage service or whatever the equivalent name in your state is. Um, but if there's a continuation of that and they've had the education, then it's time to have a public hearing on their license if that's possible because they have violated the you know, minimum age drinking laws, they violated you know, the alcohol age compliance checks. You know, one mistake, it's kind of like, you know, that can happen. Two, 
Like, what did you not get, right? Three, come on, why do you still have a license? So it's, um, we definitely wanna do that education up front. We wanna make sure they know checks are happening, but you also wanna make sure that like, yes, we will do education, we'll work with you, let's make this better. And if that fails, be ready to take those next steps and be ready to have your elected officials take those next steps. Um, so that's the, you know, kind of that cautionary. It's like, you know, like, let's move forward together. And if that works, great. But if it doesn't, be ready to take those next steps. Great. Great. So, and um, it looks like there's, um, there, Lisa's is talking about the difference between owners and servers in Florida that are, tend to be the problem, and I think that's really interesting. Um, yes. So it it is a is a uh, a good point. Um, as we kind of approach the end of our time together, I just want to make sure that we share with you that there is a survey to can do at the end, and let's move on to the next slide, uh, Maureen, um, to see if there are any specific questions that folks. Oops. Oh. Sorry. If there are any questions that folks have, you can throw them in the chat. But while we do that, I will watch for, for those. But we can go ahead and share with you that you can join us. Um, you can join us next week on the 29th um, at the same time, where we'll be talking about demystifying alcohol policy strategy. So we're really getting into the planning and implementation of this work. So when we ask, what are you gonna do in the next 30 days? A lot of you are saying, I'm gonna educate myself. I'm gonna learn a little bit more. I'd also encourage you to come to this webinar where we're gonna talk about really the planning and implementation, kind of get into some more nitty gritty about how to do this work. So uh, I encourage you to, um, to make sure that you're registered for that. And I thought there was a link for that in here, but I do not see it. Um, we do have some upcoming events, some more upcoming events that uh, will help you in your prevention work. We're doing a Change Leader Academy for prevention practitioners, and we're going to talk about continuous quality improvement in your implementation. Uh, Chris has put in just so you can see down there, there is a link in the chat for registering for our next week's policy webinar. Sorry. Thank you, Chris, for that. Um, we also uh, have working together, understanding how community coalitions can partner with college campus prevention. So I heard someone in here talk about uh, some campus related issues. So if you're in a community that that has uh, that partners with a college or that you know you're in a college town um, or you're on a college campus and you want to work with the community, this is really uh, a webinar for you about uh, how to make those connections. We also have the effective group facilitation skills for prevention professionals, which is going to be great. Um, uh, just about, you know, so much of the work we do is facilitating conversations. Um, so group facilitation skills, engaging youth in substance misuse programs. Uh, that's uh, August 29th. So we're excited to be providing that as well. And I think that's the, oh, nope, we have one more, the importance of advocacy. So it's kind of a follow up to this, right? So we've talked a lot about um, uh, about policies here, but we're going to move in on, on September 20th and do kind of a really focused conversation around advocacy for prevention, what it is and how to conduct that that advocacy. Um, so I think that's that's what we have on the docket for now. There's more coming. Please go to our website. Um, there is a link up there um, that can take you to get some of those. We also have healthy knowledge courses that you can get to. Uh, they're self-paced free online courses in, in the healthy knowledge platform. You can earn certificates of participation and there's already 41 courses and, and counting. Right, so we're adding more um, all the time. So uh, you can follow that link that Chris put in the chat and it'll take you to the Healthy Knowledge site. We do ask that you spend just a second to complete this evaluation for us. You can shoot that QR code with the, uh, your phone and do it right there or follow that link that's in the chat. Uh, it's been, we popped it in the chat a couple of times. We'll do it again. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, again, it just takes a couple of minutes. There'll also be a follow-up survey. Uh, we do ask that you take the time to do that. It's so helpful for us as we continue to improve and grow the work that we're doing. So thank you so much for that. I don't see, I see a lot of thank yous, but I don't see any additional questions that have come up in the chat since we moved on and we are approaching the uh, the end of our time together. We have just one minute left. Um, so I don't think I've missed anything. I got all the, the things I wanted to share. Um, 
and um, I uh, I appreciate uh, you guys being here with us and really really contributing to this conversation. So thank you so much. Um, you did make it a richer, more interesting conversation. Maureen, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. We are really excited to spend another hour and a half with you next week on the 29th. Um, so we look forward to all of you and more being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. <laughs>